first, live, local. This is Fox 12 Now. Hello, welcome to Fox 12 Now. I'm Greg Nibbler. I wanted to go straight to that shot right there. That is our ski bowl camera up there on Mount Hood, and it looks amazing. Sometimes you'll watch this and see some skiers or snowboarders go through there. It's, uh, it looks pretty nice up at the mountain right now, but... Thank you for being here with us. So again, this is Fox 12 Now. We live stream here every weekday starting at 1 p.m. Pacific. We're on our, fa our Facebook app, on YouTube, our Fox 12 Oregon apps, and our website. So lots of places to find us and uh, stream the content that we have, and of course watch those segments later. Right now, we're going to be talking to Oregon State University about a specific project they had called the OSU Hoopa Ringtail Project. That's a lot to unpack right there. I will say this for a ringtail, in case anybody doesn't know, I just wanted to put this out here right at the very beginning. There is an example of a ringtail. So uh, that is, uh, that's part of what we're gonna be discussing right there, that guy right there in the tree. But to do so, we are joined right now by one of the lead research scientists on this project, Sean Matthews. And Sean, thank you very much for being here with us today. Appreciate you joining. You know, when I saw about this project and saw, saw just everything that goes in, into it and that was involved in it, I was really happy to get you on here to talk about it. So I think to start off, can you give us a basic explainer of what this project is? Yeah, you bet. Thanks for having me, Greg. Really appreciate the opportunity. Um, yeah, so the Hoopa um, Ringtail Project was was really uh, kicked off in a, a big collaboration. So definitely want to acknowledge all of our partners on the project, primarily the Hoopa Tribe. Um, Hoopa Valley Indian Tribe is has been a longtime collaborator of our, our work, um, as well as Humboldt State University, now Cal Poly Humboldt. Um, and so this was actually a graduate thesis that was done through Cal Poly Humboldt, at that point Humboldt State University by Cale Myers. And really the goal was uh, to understand more about ringtail. I mean, this really amazing, like you saw in the video there, just this really cute, adorable critter that I bet a lot of folks just don't know much about, including us as, as biologists um, and forest managers just don't know a lot about. And so the ringtail are culturally important to the Hoopa people. Um, they, they serve a variety of roles in the culture, and but the tribe also has a timber-based economy. And so they're extracting timber as, as many um, rural communities in, in Northern California and Southern Oregon do. Um, and ringtails depend on these forests to, to make a living and, and to survive. And so the tribe was really interested in understanding, okay, how can we, how can we continue to have a timber-based economy, continue to extract timber from the landscape, from the reservation, while also conserving species that depend on these forests like ringtail? Right, I, and I mean, that seems like such an important conversation to have in so many different aspects too, you know, all over the Northwest and anywhere where you have these forested areas is figuring out that correct balance. And, and I love that this one focuses on, on the ringtail. Can I ask you a quick question here? Is the plural of ringtail, ringtail? Uh, I think it's ringtails. Okay, yes. ringtails. Yes. All right. I just want to make sure. I, I wasn't sure if I heard it correctly. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so for um, so let's let's talk about I guess ringtails first, and then I want to talk about the hoopa side as well. So, for ringtails, can you give us just a, a bit more of an explanation as far as what they actually are? Because I feel like they are native to Oregon, but um, it's it's something I've never seen out in the wild before, and uh, would love to know a little bit more about what these what yeah. these ringtails are. Yeah, absolutely. So ringtails are a mammal. Um, they're they're kind of shaped a little bit like a house cat. If you can imagine, you know, your house cat at home, they have these kind of big giant ears, big giant eyes, but but they're about the size of a gray squirrel. So gray squirrels we see kind of cruising around here in Oregon. They're they're about the same size as a gray squirrel. So so not that big, um, but kind of weasel cat shaped. Um, and they have, like you can see in the videos here, these, these huge giant eyes, they're nocturnal. And so they uh, are active at night. Um, and so rely on these really big eyes to, to see at night. They also have those giant ears that are just super adorable, um, helps them hear and kind of navigate through the forest at night. Then their coat is kind of this like brownish, grayish uh, to dark, even almost to black on top, but then that really distinctive banded tail, um, alternating white and black, uh, hence their name, the ringtail. Um, they're related to raccoons um, and and in the raccoon family, um, but but really kind of kind of their own entity here in the forests of Oregon and California. They are pretty widely distributed. They're distributed down um, into Mexico um, and then extend all the way up into California. 
uh, into or into southern Oregon. Um, about the furthest north they get is is maybe a little bit north of Grants Pass uh, in the coastal forests. Um, they they aren't over in the Cascades. So um, that's kind of their distribution. And and they as far as their life history, they they live in forests. Um, in northern portions of the range and the southern portions of the range, like down in Mexico and Arizona and Mexico, they're primarily in forests or in uh, deserts where they'll even uh, hang out in cactuses, like hollow er areas of cactuses they'll hang out in. But here up north in the northern portions of their distribution, they're, they're hanging out in forests. Um, they eat all kinds of things. They're a generalist. Um, they'll eat mice, rats, voles, uh, but even berries, shrubs, uh, things like that. Um, you mentioned, you know, that they, they live in, in cactuses, you know, in certain places as well. So, so during this study, I guess, I want to find out how you went about this study, but I also, I, to ask the question, what did you find out about ringtails that we didn't know before from this study? Yeah, yeah. So I guess to, to get at it, what, what the goal was really is to, was to understand um, ringtails, like I said, are nocturnal, and so they're active at night. But during the day, they need places to, to hide and, and rest and avoid, say, inclement weather, um, other predators, things that eat them, like bobcats, mountain lions, even fishers, a big weasel, uh, will, will hunt and, and actively uh, pursue ringtail. So during the day when these other critters are active, they, they need secure places to hang out um, during the day when they're resting. And so those tend to be in hollowed out trees in, in a lot of uh, the northern portions of the range in Northern California and Southern Oregon. And so we were really interested to understand what, what kind of trees are they using? What do these trees look like? Um, what kind of um, forest stands are they in? So that we can then hand that information off to forest managers when they're out laying out timber sales to say, okay, we're gonna cut this group of trees over here. We're gonna save this group of trees over here. They can, in that decision-making process, they can begin to get a sense for what ringtails might be selecting on the landscape. And so that was that was really the core of the project. And what we the way we went about doing it was, um, you know, they're they're really cryptic. They're hard to see, and especially if we're out during the day, they're they're hanging out in these tree cavities. We can't we can't find them. So we need to rely on this technique called radio telemetry. Which, if you saw in the video there, they have uh, we have a radio collar, so a collar that goes around the neck of the animal, and then a transmitter that's attached to that to the. Um, collar and that sends out a radio signal. Um, it's nothing that the ringtail can hear, but with a receiver and antenna that, that we carry around with us, you can hear that transmitter uh, just sending out a beep and, and we hike to the strongest signal in the forest, find out where, what tree that ringtail is hanging out in um, and, and can find out what trees are in, what the neighboring forest looks like and, and get a better understanding of the types of forests they're in. That's fascinating. So the things we, yeah. Go, I was go just going to say, using that, that form of technology to help you actually do something that we weren't able to do before. Yeah, a lot of a lot of really cryptic species or wide ranging species. We really need to rely on these kind of more remote type uh, techniques to, to really get an understanding of especially finer scale, um, what we call resource selection. So like individual trees that they might be using. Um, you know, there are a lot of, Ideally, we'd, use, we'd, we'd try and use non-invasive methods where we don't actually have to capture and handle an animal. It's less stress on the animal. It's less stress on us as biologists. But in some instances, for the particular question, we, we need to use these more invasive methods. And uh, once you did find out you know, a little bit more about where they were staying as far as in these, these hollowed out trees and different things like that, you mentioned talking to the Hoopa tribe and then also figuring out some forest management uh, things that you could go along with that. So I guess to that extent, you know, using the knowledge that you found about, uh, found out about as far as how the ringtail uh, is living in the environment, how did you take that knowledge and then translate that into forest management? Yeah, so what we found was that ringtails do tend to use uh, a pretty specific group of trees. I mean, they'll, they'll use just about anything that has a, a hollowed out opening in it, but they tend to prefer or select more frequently um, California black oaks, um, which are pretty common in Northern California and Southern Oregon, as well as tan oak trees, um, another species of, of oak tree that that usually these trees, they, the wind will blow through or ice storm will happen, a limb will break off, fungus will get in, and those 
types of trees, those two species in particular, are really susceptible to that kind of damage. And then the, the cavity opening up um, inside the tree, the ringtail isn't excavating it on his own that you know, rely on these other processes like fungus to, to cause heart rot and then get into the cavity. So we found that they, they really prefer those two trees, which really aren't trees that, um, that timber companies or the tribe as a timber entity are really after that, they, they don't have much commercial value. Um, it's really the Douglas fir trees that they're they're targeting. Um, and so some of our recommendations were when it when they can and when it's safe to do so to try and preserve as many of those um, black oak trees and tan oak trees as possible in their operations um, so that they persist on the landscape because it takes a long time for these cavities to develop for a tree to get old enough, big enough um, to have that damage happen, have that um, fungus get in, create that cavity opening um, and a cavity big enough for a squirrel sized animal to, to occupy. And so that was, that was part of it. Um, we also interestingly, not surprisingly actually found that they tend to use these um, these trees in generally older forests. Like I said, it takes a long time for these cavities to form. So not surprisingly, we see them in yeah, forests just like that, older forests with older trees. Um, but a little bit surprisingly, what we, what we was a little unexpected was we did find ringtails using more often than we expected forests that had been recently harvested by the tribe. So within the last 10, 15, 20 years, um, forests, ringtails using these forests that, that had been recently harvested. And we really attributed that to really the management that the tribe has undertaken since they took over um, management from the Bureau of Indian Affairs back in the 1990s and, and began implementing their own version of, of timber management, which, which is very conservation focused, um, recognizing a lot of the, the interests they have for conserving these species of cultural concern. And so we, we interpreted ringtails using these younger forests, these forests that had been recently cut um, in that the tribe is doing a pretty good job of conserving a lot of these trees like the black oaks and the tan oaks that that ringtails are are really depending on and, and utilizing a lot, especially during the day um, in even recently cut forests. Do you think the results of this project, as far as what you found out, could be a roadmap to help other organizations and timber companies and things like that find that balance between harvesting timber and uh, conservation efforts? I hope so. Yeah, I, I certainly think it's applicable to to other forests beyond just the reservation, particularly forests that can have similar characteristics um, to forests like in Hoopa. So my hope is that that this research can be adopted by by other forest entities. You know, thinking about here in Oregon, we just had the big private forest accord um, un, go under uh, underway and, and implemented. And, and so hopefully as those types of agreements continue to move forward between industry and uh, the conservation organizations that are driving those, that that more recommendations like these can be taken under consideration. Well, I, I love the fact that, you know, you have this study, you've got the, the Hoopa tribe who's also involved in this, you know, and, on their lands and figuring out how they want to manage it, because I know that the ringtail, from what I read anyway from the project, has some important cultural uh, significance as well for, for the tribe. And I don't know if you care to, you know, elaborate on that, but I, I do know that that was part of it as well, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. The ringtail is important to many tribes uh, in the Pacific Northwest um, as a as a resource, a cultural resource, and also like many species on the on the reservations and in, in Aboriginal territory seen as an ancestor. Gotcha. Yep. So it, it's it's important on so many different levels, having that aspect of it to the cultural side, but also timber harvesting timber. You know, that that's part of the, the economics of it as well. So finding that balance is really, really fascinating to see see this come to fruition. And I guess, um, you know, one other question I just had for you is, you know, at, since this project, what do you think was the most interesting thing that you learned throughout all of this that you did? Yeah, I think uh, one of the interesting things we learned and one thing we're really fascinated about is not only understanding how ringtails are selecting, say, trees that they're using or forests that they're using, but how they're interacting with other species on the landscape, because, you know, obviously they don't exist in a vacuum out there in the forest. There are other species that they're interacting with, whether they're 
those are species that, that the ringtail are interested in eating or species that are interested in eating the ringtail. Um, and so one, one other uh, species that we as as an organization are pretty interested in is the Pacific Fisher, which is a bigger bodied animal about the size. This one is about the size of a house cat. It's a weasel, uh, but also of conservation concern in California, Oregon, and Washington. And so in previous work that we've done elsewhere in Southern Oregon, we actually found a, an interesting interaction between uh, fisher and ringtail, where fisher do tend to be the, as one would expect, being a bigger bodied animal, more dominant. And so we were interested to see, do does the presence of fisher maybe influence where we might find ringtail in the landscape? And what we actually found was, was a little bit surprising in that, that there really wasn't a relationship between uh, fisher and ringtail. They seem to seem to be coexisting and, and carving out their own niches uh, in the forest relatively well, even though I'm sure fisher do occasionally eat ringtail, ringtails maybe on the fact that they're nocturnal and 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 having enough cavities in trees, uh, at least on the reservation, that that the presence of fisher don't seem to be influencing where ringtail are as well, and they seem to be cohabitating pretty well. That's that's all fascinating stuff to just apply it to so many different things. And I love to, just going back to talking about the technology side, I love any type of technology can help out with something like that. And having those tools at your disposal, I'm sure were, uh, were definitely a, a bonus to, uh, to being Absolutely. able to to do this study. Well, Sean, I want to thank you very much, you know, for joining us to talk about this. It's really interesting work that you did here. And for everybody out there too, um, where can we direct them if they would want to learn more about this, more about the ringtails, more about the Hoopa project and all of that? Yeah, absolutely. You can certainly check out uh, our website. Uh, just You just Google Oregon State University Institute for Natural Resources and, and find us. Um, we've got pages there. Also encourage folks to, to check out the uh, Hoopa Valley tribes websites as well to, to learn more about a little bit more about their culture and, as well as forest management on the reservation. Fantastic. Sean, thank you very much for joining me today. Really, really appreciate it. Absolutely, Greg. Thanks for the invitation. You bet. And for everybody watching too, again, this is Fox 12 Now, and I appreciate all of you joining us here. Like I, I mentioned at the start of this, we live stream every weekday starting at 1 p.m., so all kinds of things that we talk about out here. At 1.30 p.m., we're going to switch gears a little bit. I've got Eric Gorson from Around the House Northwest, who's going to be joining me to talk about spring yard tips. So shifting gears about, uh, you know, when should you start planting your grass, all of that stuff. He's got tips and tricks. That's going to be at 1.30 p.m. So you can join me right back here, wherever you're watching, on whatever platform, I'll be there. Uh, I do recommend downloading the Fox 12 Oregon app, though. That is a great place to watch all of our content and the segments that we get to cover. But that's it for right now. I will talk to you soon. I'm Greg Nibbler. This is Fox 12 Now.